Raise your hand if you think the Pittsburgh Steelers are overrated. We touch on the next on Ravens Talk. Look, this the Raven Talk, this the Raven Talk, this the Raven Talk podcast. Yeah. Follow us on Instagram, on YouTube for the broadcast. Say, this the Raven Talk, this the Raven Talk, this the Raven Talk podcast. Yeah. Now, old news, this is new news to the whole world where they ball at. Come and listen to the former writer. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it is Steelers Week. Ravens fans circle this on their calendar every single year. Find out what we had to do to go ahead in Pittsburgh and pick up that W. Look back on that Bengals game. Touch on a little bit why it is, and I'm a little bit excited about this Ravens team, even though the Ravens have faltered a little bit on defense. We touch on that. We get my thoughts on the Ravens as a whole because we're at the halfway point, at least a little over the halfway point, actually, in this NFL season. So we touch on where the Ravens stand as we're closing in on the end of this chapter in the 2024 season. But next, first, I should say, Ravens get the job done. I mean, they beat the Broncos pretty handily. Defense showed up against Bo Nix. Offense looked mwah, spectacular. 41 points. Short week. Trudging along on Thursday night football. Not a lot of practice for our star QB. Didn't matter. He came into Thursday night football in Baltimore. We know how the Ravens do in prime time. Pick up the win. 35-34 thriller. These Bengals fans must be livid. Star performance from your quarterback. Two games this season. Pick up L's both times. Now Lamar Jackson's 9-1 against the Cincinnati Bengals. Woo. Tough. If you're a Bengals fan, I would not want to see the Bengals again until 2025. Stay away, Cincinnati Bengals, please. I don't want to see you. They looked spectacular on offense. Bengals don't have much of a run game. Wouldn't matter if they did. This run defense the Ravens have is top-notch, number one in the league. More passing from Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow. That connection continues. I thought heading into this game, no T. Higgins. They have Burton, obviously. Looks like a stellar receiver in the making. But yeah, Jamar Chase and Jamar Chase only to worry about. I thought for sure the Ravens would take the same approach they took against the Broncos. Play a little more aggressive, more man, more press coverage. No. More soft coverage, bend but don't break system that, I mean, has led to a 7-3 record, yes, but very frustrating, if not for the superb job of Lamar Jackson in our offense. I'm not sure where this team would be because this defense continues to play soft coverage against these offenses. Yes, Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase are probably the number one tandem in all of football. Yes, this passing attack is superb. Yes, if Joe Burrow wasn't on a losing team, he'd likely be one of the lead front runners for MVP. Doesn't matter. You have to play aggressive. Whatever philosophy you had in 2023 seems to have all but extinguished in 2024. This team needs to find that fire again. Be aggressive. Obviously, whatever you're doing right now isn't working to the level you thought it would. Of course, there are some caveats to that statement, and we'll get into it a little bit later. But for the most part, the Ravens need to get aggressive. Press coverage. Get in there. You got Marlon Humphrey. You drafted Nate Wiggins in the first round. Brandon Stevens has shown in the past to be a liable, a reliable, I should say, cornerback. So why are you continuing to press off? Why are we five, six, seven yards back from the receiver, letting him get free releases and not expecting this guy to do damage? Yes, the Ravens routinely play prevent in certain situations, but from start to finish, these guys are six, seven yards in the back of the field, and there are a lot of instances in this game where I can say the Ravens had a shot to close things out. Let's get into it. I know we want to talk about it. I know Ravens fans have been clamoring to talk about it. Marcus Williams. <sighs> I don't even know where to begin. I, I, in fact, I won't say much. I will say this. Marcus Williams, for 80% of the time, is great at safety. He does his job. He where he needs to be. He's communicating with his teammates. He's deciphering what the offense is trying to do. He's reacting accordingly. All as is, all is well as end well. I mean, for the most part. Sometimes when he's playing under and he gets in the middle of that field, he can be a liability at times. But for the most part, he's doing his job. It's those instances where he's either unaware of what's going on with the offense, unaware of what the defensive coordinator is calling, or just lost on the field altogether that you see those big chunks of plays. We talk about that. One play strike by Jamar Chase, two Jamar Chase, just to say, 70 yards, where it's clear that Brandon Stevens is expecting help up top. 
and Marcus Williams makes the beeline for that uh, middle of the field and still not middle of the field, but the sideline where the uh, receiver is making that out route. I mean, it's just, it's tough to watch as a fan of the game, as someone who's watched this defense last year look completely different from a past defense aspect. So I'm not completely out of the running in, re- in regards to being a fan of Marcus Williams. I still think Marcus Williams has a purpose in this defense. I still think that he can be that reliable safety. But how long can I say this? It's week 11. Ladies and gentlemen, it's week 11. I mean, there's only 17 weeks, 18 weeks in the season. You know, I mean, how, how, how much am I going to be sitting up here? I feel like I've sat in this chair for the last 18 months saying this, but Marcus Williams needs to get it together. I know there's a lot of flack on Brandon Stevens. And yeah, that transition from safety to corner is no joke. So for him to make that transition and be effective, yes, it's great. Is he as great of a zone corner as he is a man corner? No. I mean, everybody has weaknesses to their game. There's a reason why Marlon Humphrey's not an outside corner. You know, there's things about Marlon's game that may not be, you know, the best in that situation. But Marlon's a great slot corner. I mean, he's not bad at outside corner. He's just a way better inside corner. And that's what we're seeing with Brandon Stevens being a better man corner than a zone corner. And you're seeing in certain instances when they're down enough plays where they're playing man coverage. Brandon's right there. Brandon's right there. So I'm not ready to sell out on Brandon Stevens and Marcus Williams. I've heard, you know, some rumblings about maybe Brandon Stevens move over to safety, get Marcus Williams and Eddie Jackson out of there. Stop. It's week 11. This team is who they are. I think they're coaching. that needs to be done, obviously. They need to figure some things out, find out who they're trying to be as a defense. But this is your team. The trade deadline's passed. Draft is long gone. This is who you got. You better make it work. But, you know, that's just, I I mean, again, Ravens won. I I know the tone of this segment of the show will lead you to believe otherwise, but the Ravens did pick up the victory. And... It might not have been a one-point win. I mean, you saw the referee make some questionable calls, especially that fourth and uh, long call that somehow the Bengals converted, even though it didn't even look like the guy caught the ball. It didn't look like he crossed the first down line, but they gave it to him anyway. I think, they're, I think, I think the Ravens did pretty good at home. You know, but shout-outs to the Bengals again. I don't want to see the Bengals again. I don't want to see an orange stripe until 2025 minimum. I mean late 25. I'm talking November. Don't, don't play these guys in September. I don't want to see them. I have Bengals fatigue. I'm sure the Ravens, both coaching, players, front office, I know they agree with me in that one. Those boys can play, and they are not at all a 4-16, and much like the Kansas City Chiefs are a 9-0 team. I mean, let's, let's call a spade a spade. I know this is the Ravens Sock Podcast, but let's talk about that, that field goal block that kept the Chiefs undefeated. I mean, the Chiefs don't look good. They look good, but they don't look that good. They don't, they don't look 9-0 good. Just like the Bengals are bad, but they're not four and six bad. They should be fighting for a wild card spot, and they're still in it. So there's a chance the Ravens may see him again, and God help us if that's the case. I might need to call my cardiologist and get another set of blood pressure medications. My goodness, these shootouts are stressing the fans of Baltimore out. But there are other things about this defense that I think we need to talk about. Not all on Marcus Williams. I saw something from Nate Wiggins. I think you look corner of the end zone that Jamar Chase catch. The waning seconds of the game, you know, Nate Wiggins is to play back a little bit. You know, he, he, he's there's a situation where you have a, a receiver uh, in the flat, you have a defender there covering them. You don't need to be there with them. Understand where Jamar Chase is. Obviously, Jamar Chase is the most important guy in that red zone. So you need to make sure you have an on him. Play a little deeper, and that catch doesn't get made. At least it's way more difficult to make that catch if you're Jamar Chase. So it's not all on Marcus Williams, not all on Brandon Stevens. It's small things like that that need to get together. The talent is there. You see when these guys make plays, for the most part, they're flocking to the ball. Close out speed to Nate Wiggins is still elite. Marlon Humphrey's still out there making plays, still looking good. Kyle Hamilton got hurt, injured, but when he was out there, looked good. Pass rush looked way better this time for the Ravens. So lots of good things out of that Bengals game, even though the Bengals scored five touchdowns and Joe Burrow threw for 420 plus yards on his defense, but there are things I took from this game to say, okay, I see the vision. Just let's, let's tighten up. I mean, tighten up a lot, but you're not going to play Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow 
17 times this season. Good chance the Bengals don't even make the playoffs. You don't see them there. The chances of you playing a high octane offense like this, not high. Not high. So it's, it's, it's a, a little give and take. Of course, you want to shore some things up. But I think what you saw has a lot more to do with the Bengals being able to persevere. I mean, Joe Burrow was taking heat. I mean, guys in his face, we mentioned the pass rush. And he was making those throws. A lot of those were bad decisions. Those are bad decisions that had to be made because if he didn't release it, he was getting sacked. So, I mean, so good job by the, the, the Bengals receiver core to get it together and, and grab those balls that were – some of those balls were just crazy that he was throwing when there were other guys that were available. But he couldn't go through his reads. The pass rush was just there. So I think the defense, you know, work in progress. I don't want to make excuses for the defense. It's week 11. They're the worst pass defense in the league. Yes. But they have the talent to turn it around. And everybody wants to talk about the 2006 Indianapolis Colts. And if you're a Ravens fan, you know all about that team. because They came ahead and took you out the playoffs when you had that bye. It doesn't take much to get that together. If you have the offense, and you got Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry doing their thing, you're in it. Uh, and I, I, think just, I just think that the Ravens defense has work to do, yes. But that's, it's doable work. Just get it done. Especially because... Up next on the Pittsburgh Steelers. Before we get to the Pittsburgh Steelers, when we come back, we'll give my synopsis, my take of this team in the middle of the portion of the season. I know we're a little over the middle of the season, but this is a good time to take a step back and decipher what we're looking at here. Uh, is this a team that's potentially going to make a run for a championship, or are they pretenders? We'll talk about it next on Ravens Talk. Welcome back to Ravens Talk. Ravens get the job done against those Cincinnati Bengals. Looking ahead to a Pittsburgh Steelers matchup with severe playoff implications. The two seed is on the line. One seed is looking like it's pretty much going to Kansas City, but you never know. There's a chance that some things get flipped, especially with that Bills-Chiefs matchup looming. Could really change some things as far as standings go, but looking like the Ravens' path to the one seed has been closed off, especially with those losses early in the season. The two seed is still up for grabs, and the AFC North division title will guarantee a home playoff game, at least one for the Ravens as they make that push to a championship run. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's, let's take a breather. Let's stop. I mean, it's been a long season. The Ravens haven't had a bye yet. You know, let's, let's take a step back and, and, and think about what we're seeing here from the Ravens. We've talked about the defense. So let's continue in that direction. Run defense, number one in the league. Matty BK, known to be a pass rushing interior lineman, definitely sought after. Also getting it done in the run game. Travis Jones getting more snaps, more opportunities to make a name for himself. He's played well when he's been healthy. He's starting to get healthy again. That interior line and that, and that linebacker, that front seven group, we've had some issues with the secondary, second level of the defense in terms of pass uh, coverage. But as far as run stopping, there's no one better. This team is so good at stopping the run that most teams don't even try anymore. I mean, you got some, some running teams ahead on the calendar for the Ravens, and I think this run unit, this defense, is going to be a huge part of where this team goes. I know the past defense has been a story, but let's pay attention to this run defense because come late November, December, January, the run game gets you to the dance. How do you think the Chiefs got to the Super Bowl? It wasn't Patrick Mahomes. It was Isaiah Pacheco, who looks to be coming back too. Little spoiler alert for you Chiefs fans who are looking in on the podcast. Jekyll's coming back. So these running backs are going to be a huge deal. I know we make a big deal about running backs not being valued correctly, but on the football field, this time of year, you need a good running back to get you to the dance. So if you have a good defense that can stop those running backs, you're in a good place. So that run defense, I love it. Number one in the league. What's not the love? And uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll continue to pay attention to see how this team continues to perform. But this run defense, it's helping them a lot because if they were bad in stopping the run and pass, we'd have a different conversation. But luckily for the Ravens, they're tops in the league in stopping the run. And they're not selling to stop the run. They're getting it done in the base defense, base front. These guys are really trying to stop the pass. And of course, as we get into it, they're not succeeding. Ravens pass defense, last in the league. Not for lack of talent. You got Kyle Hamilton, Marlon Humphrey, Marcus Williams, Brandon Stevens, you know, Nate Wiggins. Eddie Jackson, who used to be known as a ball hawk in safety during his time in Chicago. Got our Darius Washington, who's always been known. Anybody who's a Ravens fan know that he is the guy that can get after the ball 
when needed. And so you got Arthur Millett, you got Jalen Armour Davis, who practiced this week and should be good to go for this matchup against the Steelers. So you got you got guys. There's no shortage of names out there. It was very easy for me to come up with the names because they're well-known household names who have earned the reputation of being great defenders. Whatever reason, this team is not going after it. And you can point fingers at the fact that Anthony Weaver's gone. Mike McDonald's gone. Wilson's gone. And you got a first-year head DC in Zach Aurora who has struggled as far as statistics go in the past defense. I mean, that's not sugarcoated. He hasn't done a good job with his defense in that aspect as of yet. Remember, there's two sides to the defense. You can't just knock him because he's bad in pass defense. We just talked about him being the best run defense in terms of being a defense coordinator in the league. So not all bad, but that pass defense is a concern. And we talked about it. What do the Ravens need to do moving forward? I think they need to be more aggressive. Play more man coverage. And the Ravens don't play a lot of man coverage. They play zone. They try to fool the defense. I mean, fool the opposing offense. We saw a little bit of that in this game. Simulated pressure is the name of the game for the Ravens. But moving forward, they may need to shift philosophies, be more of a man coverage unit. When they played the Bengals, I know Joe Burrow had all those yards, but when they played man coverage against Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow had a 30% or lower completion percentage. I think it was 6 for 19 or something like that. So, they, they, they got the dogs to cover your guys. It's just whatever reason, this philosophy, this communication during zones when you're having to move off a of man and really trust the guy in front of you to be able to get the job done, the Ravens have been lacking on that. Maybe that improves towards the end of the season, but we're talking midpoint, and right now they're poor. But that's my suggestion. I mean, you're, you're, I'm sure if you're a Ravens fan, you're watching the media, you're listening to these uh, guys talk about the defense. When you, look, when you look at the film, it's just, what can you say? There's no, there's no, it's not really, you can't pinpoint what the difference is, what the problem is. It's a little bit of everything, and it's compounding for the Ravens' defense. Let's hope they get it together, but my suggestion has been, and it's been that for you for a while, if you're a Ravens fan who's been tuning into this podcast, be more aggressive. If you're going to lose, lose on your own terms. Just don't sit back and let them beat you. Get up there and, and fight for your win. So that's on the defense. On the offense, it's smooth sailing, baby. We're talking historically good. We talked about last year with the 2023 defense being historically great. This offense is on that same trajectory, maybe even better. Talk about Derrick Henry, the acquisition. We talked about it in March, April, when there were signs that they were going to bring him in. We were on the show. If you've been a fan of the show since the beginning, then you know I've been a Harper, a huge advocate for Derrick Henry, and I wondered what the league was thinking when they allowed the signing to happen, and you're seeing what I'm talking about. Derrick Henry has been nothing but spectacular. Justice Hill, Unsung hero of this offense, truly, along with Tyler Wallace. Those two have been huge pieces of this offensive puzzle. Now they're getting Keaton Mitchell back. Now they have Deontay Johnson coming in from Carolina. This unit continues to improve and look spectacular, especially on the rushing attack. On offense, the passing attack, Lamar Jackson, number eight. The Dundada, the, the main man, Superman, MV3, most likely. And who's stopping him? Right now, he's looking unbelievable. The game has slowed down for him. He can lean more on the running game. He doesn't have to do much with his legs. He's not afraid to do it with his legs. I think the AFC Championship game opened his eyes. Why hold myself back? Let me lose all the tools in my arsenal to get this championship. And he's doing just that. And he's looked like the unanimous MVP we saw in 2019, but even more so. Now he has a full arsenal of weaponry with his arm and legs to go after his pass catches, we mentioned Deontay Johnson. Can't forget Mark Andrews. Can't forget Say Flowers. Can't forget Rashad Bateman. I mean, Isaiah Likely is performing well. Even Nelson Aguilar is performing well. So many guys he can turn to. He's spreading the ball around. You cannot just pinpoint on one guy. If I was a defense, I'd definitely focus on slowing down Derrick Henry. Then attacking Zay Flowers because he can really extend his defense and force you into all sorts of trouble. But after that, you're pretty much screwed and just hoping for the best. And that's why this offense continues to put points, most points in the league by far. This offense is looking great. So where do I stand? Where, where do I stand with this offense, this team as a whole? Do I think, now remember, Ravens were 7-3 and three this time last year. They're 7-3 and three in 2024. Do I think this team is as good or better than the 2023 team? Yes. Yes, I do. I think they're better. Lamar Jackson is doing things that I haven't seen anyone do. The closest thing I could think of what Lamar Jackson is doing is Aaron Rodgers in his prime. The way he was just able to 
do whatever he wanted on the field. Of course, he doesn't have the running capability of Lamar Jackson, but he's just so amazing when he has the football in his hand. It's really hard to, to even decipher a way to stop him. So shout out to these defensive coordinators. You have to think about ways to stop him, but good luck. I don't see it. This guy's just too good. And I think even though this defense has struggled a little bit, I still think this team is better than last year and more equipped to move forward to the Super Bowl. Did they get it done? It does depend on if the defense can improve. I think they do. I mean, that's my belief based on what I've seen so far on film. The last three weeks have looked good on defense. I know Joe Burrow went nuts, but take a look at the film. You'll see what I'm talking about. This defense is trending in the right direction. I think they'll be fine. No Joe Burrow, no Jamar Chase most likely in the playoffs to worry about. There are other opportunities for the Ravens to struggle, but I think this team is going to be just fine. We'll see. Long season. We're closing in at the end in the playoffs, and the Ravens get a chance at revenge for the AFC Championship loss against the Kansas City Chiefs in Baltimore. Let me come back. Pittsburgh Steelers week. My favorite time of year. Ravens have lost a lot. They won in seven versus the Steelers. A lot of that isn't with Lamar Jackson, but the fact remains, they haven't won very many games yet. Do they get the job done this week? We touch on the next on Ravens Talk. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Ravens Talk. We've been echoing it throughout the show. It is Steelers week, huge week for the Ravens and the Steelers in terms of who gets to get that number one spot in the AFC North with a few games left to go in the season. These two teams, of course, will meet again later on in the season, but this is the first meeting in Pittsburgh. And the Ravens have had struggles against the Pittsburgh Steelers over the last few games. Against, If you're a Steelers fan, you said it. If you're a Ravens fan, you've heard it. One in seven is the current record between these two teams through the last eight games. Listen, <laughs> I mean, does it, need to, does it even need to be said that, you know, the last meeting with these two teams, there was no starters. Lamar Jackson wasn't playing. The Ravens had locked up the first seed in the AFC. No reason to play against a team that, you know, for all intents and purposes, wasn't going to be much of a factor in the postseason. I mean, I mean, what, what are we even talking about here? With this Pittsburgh Steelers record-wise. And then you look at the last meeting prior to that, where the receivers dropped a whole bunch of passes. And I don't want to make excuses, you know, for, for Ravens or Steelers in, in, that, in terms of that. If you drop the passes, you drop the passes. So that participated in the losing effort. That's not on Lamar Jackson, though, those drop passes. And now you're seeing a Lamar Jackson who is being more efficient, passing the football, very strategic when he decides to run it. So I'm seeing a fully mature, fully enforced Lamar Jackson that has pretty much run away with the MVP award. There's a few games left in the season and a lot could happen in terms of his play, but that trajectory is looking like MV3 for Lamar Jackson. Now, the Pittsburgh Steelers, of course, they've looked good. They look good. I've made a point to let people know that the Pittsburgh Steelers have yet to show me that they're one of the top teams in the AFC. They did have a matchup against the Commanders. It did not look great in that game. Of course, it was a fun game to watch. They came back and won it, but I want to see more. I want to see a dominant Steelers effort against a top-tier team. Doesn't they have to show up on the scoreboard? It doesn't have to be a 25-point victory against a top-tier team, but I want to see effective plays on offense and defense from their squad. We know what the defense can do. But Russell Wilson, 7 for 15 for under 50 yards in the first half. Is that supposed to elicit confidence if you're a Steelers fan? Is the Ravens uh, faithful? I don't know if I'm too nervous about Russell Wilson. I could be proven wrong, and I don't want to disrespect him too much because we saw what James Winston was able to do against the Ravens. But as far as concern with me, you got to show me. You got to show me. And the Steelers are going to have the opportunity to show the Ravens. So let's talk about it. Let's dissect the game. Let's start with the Steelers defense because this team goes where that Steelers defense goes. If you're a Ravens fan, you know all about that type of mindset when it comes to your team. Uh, this defense is led by TJ Watt, who's exceptional in this matchup. I know a lot of t- fans are concerned about what, what will TJ Watt do against Daniel Falele. He's had some ups and downs in terms of uh, combating the stunt moves that a lot of these premier pass rushers do. We talked about what these premier pass rushers can do in situations where they're asked to do stunts kind of full this offensive line, especially in the inexperience at that right side. So I could see some trepidation, but 
be wary. The Steelers do not often line up T.J. Watt outside of that right tackle spot. It's going to be Rosengarten's responsibility primarily based on what we've seen on film to have him block T.J. Watt. Now, Rosengarten hasn't had the best season. We've seen him struggle at times. He's had some good games too, but against T.J. Watt, it will be up to him to keep Lamar Jackson upright. The great news about that is it's not his blind side that he has to worry about. That's a good thing, but the Ravens may want to have some guys chip uh, T.J. Watt, give him some opportunities to get, well, make it a little more difficult for him to get to the quarterback. And Lamar Jackson does a good job at the line of scrimmage at deciphering where those blocking schemes go and helping himself out if he sees that Rosengarten's in trouble. But don't expect a lot of stunts in this game. I don't, I don't think Rosengarten is going to be the primary guy to watch out for. Uh, I think Daniel Valletti should have it in the back of his mind, but I don't expect him to either line up right next to the, the, the right guard. We don't see a lot of that. Sometimes we see DJ Watt line up across the center, but that doesn't seem like a matchup that the Steelers want to take advantage of. Kyle Linnabon has had a phenomenal season, uh, phenomenal two seasons, actually, as a Raven. So uh, that TJ Watt matchup, mm, I'm getting Micah Parsons vibes from that. I think the Ravens will do a good job of kind of steering away from his direction and doing things that will pretty much eliminate him from the game from a schematic standpoint. Now, Mike Tomlin could surprise us. You could look at film and say, hey, this right guard is struggling with stunts. Let's stunt the hell out of him until he proves otherwise. But I don't know. Based on, I know the Steelers do their thing. They're away, kind of like what the Ravens do. That's why these two rivals are so fierce in competition. They're very similar in, in a lot of ways. And something that Ravens fans and Steelers fans like may not want to admit. But the truth is, these two are very headstrong. And the Ravens and Steelers are going to do things their way in hopes to beating you. So TJ Watt could have a day against Rosengarten, but don't expect Daniel Falele to be too exposed in that game. At least that's my prediction looking at the film. Steelers defense also runs a cover three scheme. They do that very often, something that they've done in the past to success against the Ravens. A uh, couple of that means that you're going to really do your best to cover the middle of the field. So in the past, Mark Andrews has been that guy, you know, against these Steelers. And Lamar Jackson has made a point to target him. And I think that's why the Steelers did run that cover three so often against him and very effectively. That's not the case anymore. We've talked about it. They've got Deontay Johnson now. they got Zay Flowers in the second year. Rashad Bateman's finally coming to his own, finally healthy. Uh, out of the shadows of Oda Beckham. Got Isaiah Likely, who practiced fully. Looks like he's going to be a go. You got Derrick Henry, a guy that hasn't faced the Steelers in purple and black yet. Keaton Mitchell looks like he's going to be a go, getting healthy. Justice Hill. I mean, look at the names I'm rattling off just off the top of my head and tell me how the Steelers are going to be equipped to stop this team. It's going to be rough. It's, I think the Steelers' defense could have the success that the Browns did, could have the success that the Chiefs did in holding them under 30. There's, a, there's some potential for that. I don't really see it, but I could see the potential because of how stout this defense is. Their secondary isn't as great as it has been in previous years. I will take the Browns secondary over the Steelers secondary, but their front seven is unmatched. And if the Ravens find a way to get through that secondary, through that, that second level of their defense, I expect the Ravens to have success. This offense is unmatched in terms of how you combat and how you fight this team off. I haven't seen a team do it effectively yet since week two with the Raiders of all teams. So I'm very, very, very much looking forward to this matchup. Give me the edge to the Ravens, even though that Steelers front is looking good. Hightower likely won't be playing. In fact, I believe he has already been declared out. That's a huge blow to that Steelers defense. Give me the Ravens in this matchup. Steelers offense. I, I, again, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like this matchup for the Steelers, even though the Ravens' pass defense has been porous. Let me explain why. This offense is still predicated on running the football. Najee Harris has had a, a great season along with Warren. Those two have been a two-headed monster that the Steelers have used to their advantage to give Russell Wilson time in the pocket to make those throws. We saw it in action against the Commanders. Ravens' run defense is stout. Very good. And in fact, you saw in the Bengals game, the, Ravens, the Bengals didn't even try to run the football early on. They threw it immediately, partially because they knew that that run defense would do them no favors. And so the Steelers' defense, the Steelers' offense, I should say, doesn't have that pass attack of the Bengals where they can lean on it. Are they going to lean on Russell Wilson early to be that guy to, to, to combat and, and attack this defense that has struggled? Maybe, but how much faith do you have in the Steelers to have success against that? They've shown it against some other teams in the past, but 
This is the Ravens Steelers rivalry now. It's going to be different. Steelers and Ravens like to set the tone with the run. Usually, this is going to be a different dynamic. That's what I'm telling people. Yes, this is the Ravens Steelers. I don't know if it's going to be a 13 10 game. I don't, I don't see that on the horizon. So, the, the, the Steelers offense. Definitely is predicated on building that run attack first and then throughout play action, through bootlegs by Russell Wilson, getting those guys free in open space and making plays. Very similar to how the Ravens have done it in the past. Do I think the Steelers offense have enough? No, <laughs> I don't. Now, it was, the Ravens defense have been pretty bad, pretty bad. So as you mentioned, the Bengals went ahead and started attacking early with the pass. Steelers can do the same and have success if the Ravens aren't on their P's and Q's. How much do you lean on combating George Pickens? Do you play that soft coverage that the Ravens have done in the past against the Bengals? Or do you play more aggressive press coverage like they did against the, the Broncos? I think I play more aggressive. I think this 10, 11 day stretch prepare for this game will allow the Ravens to really hone in on their philosophy, change things up. We've been talking about this for weeks. Oh, the Ravens need to be more aggressive. If you're going to lose these matches, lose them on your terms. Do not let these teams beat you by sitting six, seven yards behind the line of scrimmage. So play up. You got Mike Williams, who's a speedy guy. You got George Pickens, who seems to catch anything in open space. Don't let this be another Bengals matchup where you're just letting these guys roam free, free releases off the ball and, and, and making their plays. And you're just attacking uh, post catch. I think if the Ravens do that, it's, could be the type of game many are not expecting. We don't see a lot of blowouts in these matchups, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying this, the Steelers offense isn't what you think it is. And this Ravens defense isn't as poor as you make it out to be. I made this point earlier this week, both on social media and on the AFC North round table. Besides the Bengals, teams really haven't had that much success passing the ball. You've had the Raiders who came back after being down big in the fourth quarter. Yes. The Ravens started playing prevent defense, right? And we've seen the Ravens do that throughout the Bengals game on Thursday. So you don't really see a lot of teams scoring 30 points on this defense, even though we've talked about how the Ravens have struggled in the past. Yes, thousand of those yards came against the Cincinnati Bengals. And there's the, do the Steelers have Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase? No. Do they have T. Higgins? No. So I think we need to settle down with the, I mean, again, the pass defense has to improve. Yes. Not making excuses for the Ravens defense, but I think we're overblowing a little bit that any team can come in here and toss the ball for 400 yards. I don't think that's the case. Steelers have talent, but they have to show me they can do it in big spots against big teams. They did good against the commanders. They won by one point, but they look sloppy. And their insane encroachment offsides penalty that gave the Steelers the win may have made a difference in that game as well. If you're a Steelers fan and you think, oh, we're seven and two, we're looking good, pump the brakes. Let's see how you do in this game. It'll give me a great understanding of what the Steelers team's about. Even if the Steelers lose, if you perform better than you did against the commanders, I'd get a lot more respect than just coming out and you know, being that team that you know really shouldn't be there. And the Steelers fans know, having started 11 and 0 one year, what your team is really about. Let's find out for sure. This defense is stacked. Offense is good. Are you a top tier team or are you just a good team that's going to make it to the playoffs and be one and done? We'll find out. When we come back, we'll get my predictions for the game. I think we kind of know where my head's leaning at, but we'll get final thoughts. And Steelers week will begin, and I'm very excited for this game, if you can't tell. We'll touch on the next on Ravens Talk. Yeah, uh, see, I want to answer this. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't offered to go back. Um, I think, I don't know if I said that or not, but that in the public or not. Um, I wasn't wanted back. I didn't get an offer back. And, um, you know, it's definitely kind of upsetting, you know, being there for four years and the bond that you grow with your teammates and stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, like the first few months, you definitely go through those feelings. Um, and now, after playing games, you just go by um, and just want to win games. You want to win with your teammates, your new teammates. You want to bond with those guys. Everything that you do is for the organization that you're in now. And um, like I said, I will have feelings. Obviously, uh, anybody in my position would this week. So I'm um, just take one at a time. And whatever happens, happens. How do you channel that? Uh, just I don't know. Self control. Um, prayed prayed about it a little bit. Uh, I think it, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think the outside picture makes it bigger than what it is. I think for me personally, it's just. Um, 
you know, like any situation that anybody, like I said, that would be in my shoes, they would feel a certain way, but I don't think it had to be anything more, anything extra. Have you talked to Harbaugh and or Costa since since you signed here? I have not, no. Um, never had a conversation with any, uh, either of those two, so, um, yeah. How long did it take you to kind of work through all of those feelings? We're going to end it with Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff. What was the question? I said, how long did it take you to kind of work through those feelings and get to the other side where you are now? Probably to like the end of August, early September. Uh, even though I signed and stuff, you obviously still go through those feelings and stuff. Um, just knowing that a long four years that you put in blood, sweat, and tears over there, uh, like I said, the guys that you bonded with, build close relationships with, um, even the training staff to the strength staff, everybody that you build a relationship with, you put your body on the line every single time that you went out there, even when you could barely even move your leg or whatever it may, the injury may have been. Um, you just go out there and try to do your best for that team. So I definitely did feel a type of way um, after the whole situation, but I, I'm over it now. That was Patrick Queen giving his thoughts about the rivalry. You know, when the, when the acquisition happened back in the day, I would say not back in the day, but you know, off season time. And we were just shell shocked by the by the unscrupulous traitorous nature of um Patrick Queen. Uh definitely you could tell took that signing to heart. Ravens didn't offer him a contract. I don't know why his agent didn't inform him that the writing was on the wall based on the cap and where he was at, not receiving that fifth year option that he was likely not gonna return. I don't know. But, you know, players are players. He is very much looking forward to this matchup. You can tell I'm liking the rivalry. I'm liking this side of Patrick Queen. I was very critical. If you're a Ravens talk fan from the beginning, you know I was very critical by how Patrick Queen responded to this. I thought he should play the villain. Be the guy. Don't be upset about fans coming at you. Be that guy that, you know, that takes that villain role because clearly you're going to be the villain being a Raven first round pick and shipping over to the ops. I mean, of course, you're going to be the villain embracing that role. So I think He's starting to embrace that role. I think you're going to see Patrick Queen is going to be fired up for this game, and the Ravens are going to need to match that energy from Patrick Queen. You know the Steelers faithful, both players, coaches, and fans are going to be rallying behind, behind Patrick Queen in order to get that dub for him. Of course, it's going to be even more sentimental when he returns to Baltimore a few weeks later. But for now, this is about a Ravens-Steelers rivalry that has been one-sided. No matter what you want to think as a Ravens fan, this has been the Steelers game for seven of the past eight games. Again, we mentioned about, you know, no starters, drop passes, no Lamar Jackson in four of those contests. Yeah, I get that. But at the end of the day, you got to say that the Steelers have had the Ravens number. Does that change this week? Yes. I'm predicting a 10-point victory for the Baltimore Ravens. I do not trust that Steelers offense, yes, they have looked good in spots. Yes, the Ravens defense has struggled in the past, but this is the team that is predicated on running the football and setting up the play action for Russell Wilson to get his receivers out in open space and make plays. The Ravens are not going to allow that. They're just not. It's not going to be that type of game. Expect the Ravens to win and win by two scores. That's going to do it for here. Ravens talk. It is going to be a huge Huge game. I'm very excited for it. Thank you for your patience. I know I wasn't there for the pre and post Bengals uh, game, but I'm glad we got the W. I predicted as much. I predicted the Ravens would beat the Broncos and the Bengals, and that's exactly what has happened. So it's going to be a big test for the Ravens, and they make it three straight wins. This gauntlet of matchups is coming to a head after the Steelers game. They do play Chargers, followed by the Eagles. So big matchups ahead. I think the Ravens are going to be just fine. I'm telling you. This offense is superb, and this defense, for all intents and purposes, may be a little underrated. I'm telling you, this pass defense is not what you think it is. Of course, there's some miscommunication issues that they need to shore up. But this pass defense, I believe, will get it together. Could it be the starting point in this contest against the Steelers? I believe so, but we'll see. Either way, we'll tune in next week, talk all about it, and get ready for those Los Angeles Chargers and Monday Night Football. Until then, see you next week. Look, this the Raven Todd, this the Raven.
Raven Talk, this the Raven Talk podcast. Yeah. Follow us on Instagram, on YouTube for the broadcast. Say this the Raven Talk, this the Raven Talk, this the Raven Talk podcast. Yeah. Now old news, this is new news to the whole world where they ball at. Come and listen to the former writer for the Baltimore Sports Illustrated.